And here we go. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining this Dataversity webinar, Accelerating Queries on Cloud Data Lake, sponsored today by Alexio. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the bottom middle of your screen for that feature. And if you'd like to continue the conversation after the webinar, you can continue the networking at community.dataversity.net. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Alex Ma. Alex is the Director of Solutions Engineering at Alexio and an open source veteran. Prior to Alexio, he worked for Couchbase where he was the Director of Solutions Engineering and Principal Architect. And with that, I will give the floor to Alex to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Hey, Shannon. Thank you for that intro. So, yeah, like uh, like we talked about, what we're going to go into today is how to accelerate queries uh, on data lakes in the cloud. And so I think first off, maybe we'll start off with, you know, uh, some of the things that we've noticed, uh, talk about some of the challenges uh, and and trends that we've noticed in, in general uh, production environments and talk about some ways to, to make these things a little bit more addressable. And so I think the, the first thing um, is talk a little bit about cloud, right? So everyone's in the cloud. Everyone wants to, to get into the cloud. Um, and so what we ended up noticing is that uh, a lot of people are leveraging cloud in, in really, really interesting ways. And we ended up um, referring to it internally uh, as hybrid cloud. And so what, what is a hybrid cloud? A hybrid cloud is really a scenario where you know, you are leveraging cloud uh, in any number of different capacities. You're leveraging it for compute. You're leveraging it for, you know, CPU or GPU horsepower. You're leveraging it for the, you know, big data applications um, that run uh, in that environment and the accessibility that they provide to your users. And a lot of times, um, you know, you're doing this against data that, you know, maybe you've lifted into the cloud or maybe data that's, that's still living in your existing data lake um, in your data center. And so, you know, there's a lot of reasons why uh, these scenarios exist, right? And these scenarios are, are things that you, you wouldn't necessarily run into um, five or 10 years ago, just because, you know, the bandwidth wasn't there, the technology wasn't there. Uh, but today, we, we start to see these things. And so, you know, in terms of uh, why someone might do this in the first place, you know, there's a, there's a couple different reasons. Um, you know, one is they're, they're looking for uh, efficiency and time to production. And so what they're looking at is, you know, they may talk to their data center team and say, hey, you know, we're going to blow out a new application. Uh, we need some resource. And they may be looking at a, a three to six month lead time uh, to actually get that going, to provision it, to order it, you know, all, all those typical things that you might have to do within the data center. Right? And so moving into a cloud model, you know, obviously <laughs> drastically shortens that, right? You're talking about seconds, minutes, hours, you know, maybe even days at the worst case uh, to get additional capacity for these kinds of workloads. So being able to, to get to production faster uh, compared to, you know, trying to do this on-prem is, is one reason why cloud is very attractive for people. Uh, another reason is is because that it is it's not a fixed resource, right? So with cloud, we can go up and down in terms of the amount of compute resource that we're using, right? And so I'll give you an example. You know, we have a lot of customers where they run these analytical workloads at the end of the month, and you know, at the end of the month, there is a very large demand for this data, and it is very time sensitive, and so they need a lot of CPU horsepower for that. And, you know, to be honest, this only happens towards the end of the month, right? And so in a traditional environment, you'd have to provision all of that beforehand, right? Let it sit idle, you know, for the duration of the month or find other workloads for it and then do that such that you'd have the capacity when you needed it. But in, again, in the cloud, you know, it's a, it's a different equation. Um, you know, you could shut the entire thing off, run it in, you know, kind of a idle configuration uh, and simply 
uh, expand uh, that compute when needed, you know, as needed. And so it provides a lot of flexibility, you know, for these kinds of things. Um, I think the last thing for, you know, why people want to get into cloud and um, why, they're, why they're even running these hybrid cloud environments is because it becomes kind of an intermediary step uh, before they finally get into the cloud. So, you know, we'll notice that customers that we talk to uh, are in one of three categories. They're already fully in the cloud, leveraging those benefits. They're in the data center today and thinking about getting there, or they're running a mix, right? And the mix is usually, you know, um, they're in the migratory process of getting there. That process happens to take, you know, more, more than a day, obviously. So sometimes we talk to customers and this process takes, you know, uh, several months, if not several years, to fully migrate all of those workloads. And so what ends up happening in the, the meantime is that they end up running this configuration that we call the hybrid cloud. So um, that's kind of, you know, setting the tone for some of these things, why obviously people are, are leveraging cloud uh, and what exactly a hybrid cloud is. Let's look at some of the challenges uh, and approaches to getting to a hybrid cloud, right? And so part of this is, you know, how am I going to actually run these workloads in the cloud? If I am running uh, Spark workloads, if I'm running Presto, uh, if I'm running, um, I, I guess I, I'm, I'm, I'm naming off the specific technologies, but if I'm running ETL and batch conversions, if I'm running uh, ad hoc queries, if I'm running analysis from my data science scientists, if I'm running machine learning workloads, you know, how do I, how do I stitch all of that together uh, while leveraging cloud resources? And part of that, uh, part of that equation means making that the data that I have that's so useful uh, accessible to these workloads in the cloud environment. And so there's a bunch of different ways that we can do this, right? We can copy the data by the workload, we can do a full lift and shift, or we can, you know, leverage caching in the cloud. And each of these approaches, you know, have their own benefits uh, as well as their own issues, right? And so if we take a look at some of these things, and we're going to be talking about these, you know, for you know, uh, traditional data lakes that might be running in a Hadoop environment, I guess the first thing that you might look at is how do I get the data up there? And so you might leverage things like uh, disk CP, distributed CP in the Hadoop world to get that data up uh, in the cloud and accessible by, you know, whatever it is you're trying to leverage. Uh, but the challenge with this is that a lot of times, um, you know, it's hard to identify exactly what it is that you want to lift up there. Right? So if you want to get a given workload up and running in the cloud in the next three months, um, you've got to identify exactly what it is that workload needs, right? which part of the data set. And if it's missing some of the data set, is it okay that the results are skewed, that they're off, or that the, the thing doesn't run because it's missing that data? You have to make that kind of determination. And if you can't make that determination, what you're left with is copying a large amount of data to be safe. right? to make sure that, um, you know, you can, you can still run that, right? If you're talking about lifting and shifting the entire workload, um, that's also a little bit challenging, right? If we're taking an application that has traditionally run in the data center for the last five years, we're saying, hey, we're just going to move this straight over to EC2 or, or GCP, um, that's, that's not always the best way to, to go about it, obviously, because, you know, some things you have to think about in terms of a different paradigm, and one is optimizing for the cloud itself. And without doing that, you know, it can be a little bit tricky. It can be a little bit expensive, right? Uh, you have to start thinking about things like, hey, if I lift this entire thing, what about all the processes that I still have in the data center that still need access to this data? Um, and so it becomes a little bit challenging uh, in terms of, you know, just migrating the entire thing up into the cloud. Uh, the last thing we look at is, you know, leveraging, you know, cache. Why don't I just use something like a Redis? Why don't I use, you know, S3 uh, to cache the data in the cloud just so that I can continue to, to leverage all, all that compute horsepower um, in the cloud provider's environment? Um, you know, this is great. Uh, again, this kind of points back to the first challenge, copying data by workload. You know, uh, this is great if you can identify exactly what data you have. And it's great if the workloads are read-only, but it's, again, a little bit problematic if you have uh, data that needs to be synced back to the data center. You have to figure out, you know, how to do that and add in additional application logic to get that accomplished. You have to figure out how to, you know, maybe identify which, which pieces of the data have changed, 
how to sync the deltas, how to keep in, in, in track with uh, what's going on in the production data lake in your data center. So lots of things to think about, right, in terms of uh, being able to leverage these resources, but also being able to make data accessible to these resources. So, um, you know, what we're going to look at is a solution from Alexio uh, that we call Zero Copy Burst uh, to allow you to leverage the cloud to scale these applications. So, like we're talking about, you know, we have our, our data lake uh, is running in HDFS, and, you know, it's, it's bound on some kind of resource, right? It is maybe compute bound, it's out of vCPU, maybe it's I.O. bound, um, maybe it's, you know, it, it, it's bound on, you know, just uh, the environment could be faster, you want to leverage, you know, some other resources. And so, um, we've got our Direct Connect, and we're set up against uh, AWS, uh, but some challenges start to arise, right? You know, I am leveraging uh, a gigabit ethernet or 10 gigabit ethernet connection down to HDFS, and, you know, the latency and the bandwidth um, may not be sufficient for what I am trying to do, right? If I'm running a um, ad hoc query through Presto, and that query looks at three terabytes of data as part of its, you know, uh, you know question, to answer a given question, you know, doing that every single time over a 10 gig pipe, um, it just very quickly becomes an unscalable solution, right? Uh, and again, like we've just outlined, you know, copying data to the cloud has its own challenges, right? It's difficult to maintain those copies. Uh, once I get those copies of data into the cloud, I still, you know, if I'm in an industry where security and governance are important, I'm, I'm charged then with, you know, how do I, how do I keep this, uh, this data secure? when I'm running it in a data lake in the cloud. Um, and so there, there are challenges with that as well. And so, you know, with Alexio, uh, what we're able to do is we're able to help make this a workable solution so that you can accelerate your queries in the cloud against your data lake, right? And so what it allows for is it allows access from the cloud to your data lake that lives on-prem and what it allows for is it allows Alexio to handle the orchestration of pulling the data as it's requested uh, into the cloud, caching it, and uh, you know, removing the overhead of having to manually define data sets to copy, removing the overhead of having to manually define processes to uh, copy this data, keep it in sync with what's going on, uh, and it provides local performance in the cloud for these applications. And so other benefits are that, you know, it scales, you know, in a cloud-native way, right? And so these applications that you might be running, uh, these big data applications, uh, if they're running in an ECS, in an EMR, uh, what have you, uh, Alexio is able to scale and work with, you know, how things flex up and down in a cloud environment. Uh, additionally, benefiting you is that a lot of that workload is enabled without adding additional I.O. workload to the data lake or without adding additional compute requirements on the existing data lake because we've shifted this all over to the cloud and now we're able to leverage the cloud itself. The last thing to point out as part of this solution that gets interesting is that not only does it enable you to run and improve the performance of queries running against your data lake that's on-prem, but it also allows you to start migrating and populating a data lake in the cloud if that's the end goal that you have. And so it benefits organizations from what we've seen by not only enabling these workloads in the first place, right, but a lot of times these workloads are driven by hardcore analysts or hardcore data scientists, right? They're used to writing Spark jobs in Scala or they're used to writing direct SQL uh, to query things with Presto. Uh, but a lot of times, there's a lot of business consumers that would love to have access to this, but the tools don't exist in-house in the data center to provide easy access. And so the second part of this is that Alexio can actually also be used to not only enable the workload, but also to help with migration of the data into a cloud data lake. And once it's in that data lake, you can start taking advantage of that data by making it accessible to more of your consumers with a broad array of 
tools that are enabled, uh, that are available in the cloud environment for a variety of different consumers. So if you're trying to do machine learning, you could leverage things like uh, SageMaker in AWS. Um, you can train models. You can, you can do all kinds of things that, um, you know, are more accessible to a wider variety of audiences than those that are just simply used to writing Python against TensorFlow uh, or, you know, direct jobs against Spark and Presto. And so that's an additional benefit um, for Alexio. So let's take a look at a few examples of people that are doing this, and then we'll, we'll go into the nuts and bolts of how Alexio actually helps out with uh, enabling some of these things. Okay. And so uh, I think the first thing to look at is Development Bank of Singapore, DBS. And so they're a large bank uh, based out of Singapore, and they're leveraging Alexio for a number of different things, right? Um, they're leveraging Alexio for a unified namespace. They have multiple different data stores, data silos, if you will, uh, multiple HDFS clusters. They have data stored in S3. And for some of these applications, they simply need a, a way to kind of make all of this data transparently accessible to their applications, and they actually do that through Alexio. Um, they leverage it for object stores, right? Uh, object stores are a great way to store data, large, large amounts of data in a scalable way. Uh, but there are a number of things that start to become a little bit challenging when you start leveraging object stores for these kinds of workloads, right? Um, and so things like uh, metadata operations, renames and moves, um, listing files, listing directories, uh, all of those become a little bit more tricky against an object store than uh, a traditional file-based store like, like HDFS. And so Alexio helps out dramatically with that. Uh, and lastly, uh, they use Alexio for the exact thing that we've been talking about, being able to uh, leverage AWS resources against data that lives in their data center to do model training and be able to sync those results of the trained models back to their on-premise data center, right? And so this is kind of what it looks like. Um, you know, they have on the left, their internal Singapore data center, and in there they run a lot of different big data frameworks, right? Um, they run Spark on Yarn, they run Presto, um, they have Alexia running there, and multiple HDFS clusters. And connected to that, uh, through Direct Connect, is uh, another set of workloads, right? This is running um, Alexia again. It's running um, uh, AWS EMR for both Spark and Presto, uh, and they're doing analytics and machine learning on there. Uh, and they're also leveraging uh, AWS uh, or Amazon SageMaker uh, to help train with these models as well. And so what they're able to do is, you know, take their 50 terabytes or so of historical data and voice data and be able to use that to train models in the cloud based on, you know, up-to-date information uh, and take that to understand better how their customer's journey is going uh, so that they can support them better when they call in. Uh, and so all of this is enabled through, you know, this sheer combination of Alexio, right? Uh, it just makes things a little bit more efficient, makes the entire overall solution, uh, you know, a viable one in the first place. Uh, Walmart uh, is another great example of, uh, you know, this hybrid cloud leveraging uh, compute resource in the cloud. Now, this is a different cloud. This is running in uh, Google cloud platform, and uh, same kind of thing, right? And so in this case, they've got multiple large HDFS clusters that live in the various Walmart data centers, and they have decided that, hey, you know, we need, a, um, we need uh, to offer querying as a service for a lot of our consumers. And to hit that scale, what they've decided to do is actually leverage GCP. And what this does is it supports around 3,200 users across 40 business groups uh, for ad hoc querying and analytics. And the only reason, again, that it scales is that they're able to, to leverage um, Google Cloud Platform and leverage Alexio to pull in the necessary data, cache it into the cloud, and improve query performance uh, without you know, having to do direct access to the HDFS data lake every single time. Uh, additionally, what they're able to do is, again, leverage that uh, capability of Alexio to have the query dictate what data is hot and 
leverage Alexio to migrate or start, or not migrate, but start populating the data lake in Google Cloud Store. And once again, that, uh, that data is accessible there, uh, they can actually look at it with other tools as well. So not only do they look at it with Presto, but it's also available through other direct Google technologies, things like BigQuery, um, so that, again, it's available for a wider audience because the data is accessible. Last use case is uh, a customer that we worked with um, where, you know, they kind of, they ran out of room in their data center. And so this is a hybrid cloud configuration, but on-prem, and it's a uh, hybrid cloud in the sense that, uh, you know, it, the challenge is exactly the same, even though, you know, it's not in a, a given cloud provider. Um, large 30 petabyte Hadoop cluster uh, that's running within one data center uh, that they're, you know, physically maxed out of capacity on and physically oversubscribed on CPU on. And so um, their analysts and their business users uh, have a need for ad hoc querying. And so what they were able to rig up is essentially they're able to leverage uh, capacity in the new site to, um, to deploy a large number of machines uh, running Presto and Alexio. And uh, Presto and Alexio are able to cache the data from their production Hadoop warehouse uh, or, or data lake um, and use that to provide query performance that's like, you know, the two are, are, are running within the same site, right? And so what it allowed them to do is, you know, not heavily invest in the network, uh, be able to manage this new workload uh, and not have to figure out an alternate solution that, you know, involved construction in the existing data center, right? And what we're looking at here are some of the query times, right? Uh, what we're looking at is Presto and Alexio compared to Spark SQL. Uh, this, this graph is actually missing something. It, it, what it's missing is the original uh, numbers from when this was uh, running within the same data center. Um, but the performance uh, that they are getting is essentially 3x of what their prior solution was. So being able to uh, enable these new solutions where these things are completely remote uh, is something that Alexio can be very helpful with. Okay. So we spent a lot of time, you know, talking about kind of the challenges, you know, kind of the desire to move to the cloud, um, high level about what Alexio is, and a little bit about some of the customers that are actually using it. Uh, let's dig in just a little bit about the technology and give you a sense for how Alexio does any of these things that we've been talking about uh, over the last 25 minutes or so. And so uh, with Alexio, uh, I would say there are a couple key innovations that actually when you combine them together, uh, give you this capability to run data orchestration for a hybrid cloud, right? And those things are uh, data locality, data accessibility, and data elasticity. And so what we'll do is we'll kind of dig into what each one of these things mean and uh, give you some additional context. Um, first, data locality with intelligent multi-tiering, uh, really what that is, is, is the Alexio worker process is typically going to be installed, co-located with whatever big data framework you're trying to uh, enhance. And so it could be Apache Spark, it could be Presto, uh, it could be TensorFlow, uh, but typically there will be unused resource on that machine that we can actually leverage to make that framework run better, right? And so Alexio is very configurable. Um, you can actually specify, you know, hey, this, um, these Spark executors, um, they're configured with uh, this amount of memory. We'd like to, you know, allocate uh, 10 gigs from each of these nodes to Alexio and we'll, we'll allocate it as memory, as RAM. Uh, whereas with something like Presto that might be very memory hungry, you might say, you know, hey, Presto is going to leverage all the memory uh, for its JVM heap for the queries that it's doing, but there's a bunch of SSDs on these machines. So we can actually define uh, or configure Alexio so that it can leverage those as a tier for storing and caching data local to that Presto worker, right? And so it's very configurable. You can tell it, hey, I've got uh, memory, I've got SSD, or I've got spinning disk, and I want to allocate some of it to Alexio. And Presto, and, and these frameworks will essentially uh, request data. Alexio will reach over to the data lake where that data lives 
and pull that data down locally. And um, you know, the, the first time it does it, it's going to be the exact same as if you didn't have a Luxio installed. But from then on, every single uh, interaction with that piece of data is going to be very quick because it's no longer reaching out to the remote data link. Uh, now it's it's talking to the local machine, not doing any network I/O, and able to service it from the local memory, SSD, or HDD. Um, you know, one of the things that's really interesting is that, you know, Intel is a, a strong partner of Alexio, and um, they match up perfectly, you know, with this kind of architecture. Um, what they've done is they've come out with uh, a couple new technologies, uh, and the one we're going to look at today is called Optane Persistent Memory, and it's a new class of memory and storage technology, and what it allows you to do is essentially have a layer um, that, you know, I think of as that sits between uh, direct DRAM on the machine and something like an NVMe, right? And it gives you, again, another option to store very large amounts of data in memory for a lower price uh, than just, you know, filling up the machine with RAM. And so, again, gives you uh, really interesting options. Uh, here are some specs for, um, you know, the, what the Optane DC persistent memory uh, chips are available as. But once you tie that in together, what you're able to do is essentially you're able to configure a Luxio with multiple different tiers. And so, you know, for our customers where they're storing, you know, 300 terabytes uh, of data, um, it may not be feasible to store all of that in, you know, uh, direct DRAM. Uh, but the Intel opt-in persistent memory uh, solution give them an option where they can actually leverage, you know, a, a good chunk of that in a more economical way um, than just filling up DRAM, and it gives them additional performance on top of something like an NVMe SSD. So a really interesting option from our partners at Intel, uh, but one more thing to consider in terms of uh, what you could do with Alexio in these kinds of environments. Um, the second innovation, uh, coming back off that tangent, uh, for why Alexio uh, enables these things is accessibility of data, right? You know, it's one thing to have a solution that works with just, you know, um, uh, that's Spark specific or that might be, you know, specific to a, a given framework. Uh, but what Alexio does is it actually sits as a middleman, if you will, in between a very large number of big data frameworks and between a very large number of places where you might store that data. And it handles the accessibility and the translation between those two constituents. And so what we're able to do is sit in the middle and offer interfaces to all of the big data frameworks so that they're able to talk to Alexio in the way that uh, is most efficient for them. Um, and we also have drivers on the southbound side so that we're able to connect to any of these different storage layers. And so through Alexio, you might have uh, some of these things that were not, you know, it, it may not be easy to configure Spark to talk to S3 as well as HDFS as well as um, a Minio object store, um, but it's very easy to configure it to talk to Alexio, and Alexio is very easy to configure to talk to all, of the, all three of those things. And it can bridge the translation between all those and give you a single place to configure, you know, access to all of these different things. Um, unified namespace is another part of this, right? Part of running these workloads is having accessibility to data, right? And what uh, Alexio does is instead of saying, you know, hey, you know, this, this piece, this chunk of data is stored on this data lake, and this other piece is stored on Google Cloud Store, and this other piece is stored on S3, uh, what you're able to do is have Alexio mount all of those different objects, to, all of those different storage layers and prevent, present a single unified interface such that your application sees data very similar to the view that you have here, right? You, you have a path, and along that path, you have access to different points of data. And from an application standpoint, you don't really need to care that, you know, hey, this is on S3, and I need, you know, this access key to get to it, or, hey, this is on uh, Google Cloud Store, and I need this interoperability token to get to it or, hey, this is located on HDFS, and I need to configure my application with these key tabs and these principles. So all of that is kind of abstracted away, and the application developers can focus on, you know, the, the business logic 
uh, that they're trying to implement in their application, not the infrastructure concerns of where this data is, how do I get access to it? Put in another way, this is a, a kind of another view uh, of it. Uh, Alexia is accessed through a URI, uh, very similar to HDFS or S3, and uh, data is located along a path. And so what you can see here is we actually have two things going. Um, at the root mount point, what we've mounted is a HDFS data lake. And within that file system hierarchy, there is a users folder with Alice and Bob within it. Um, we also have a nested mount point that points to an S3 bucket, and that's mounted as uh, slash data within Alexio, and that represents report and sales. And so for an application that's accessing this data, uh, what it's able to do is, again, not really care where the data itself is located. Uh, it can simply access data along this Alexio scheme uh, to fetch the data that it needs. Uh, when it comes time to start populating that data lake, what we're actually able to do is we're actually able to define policies. Um, and we're able to do so in such a way so that we can say, hey, I want to mount my HDFS on-prem data lake in slash data, but I also want that mounted against S3. And so you can actually configure Alexio to mount both of these storage layers to the same location and then define a policy such that, you know, hey, as you access data through this mount point, if data is read or written, uh, what I want you to do is after, after X amount of time, I want you to copy or move that data to the second storage layer. You know, so as an example, you know, if I run a uh, Spark job against a given folder of data within HGFS, uh, after three days, that data might automatically get copied to S3 or it might automatically move to S3, depending on what it is I've defined as an Alexio policy. And really, again, what that allows us to do is not have to pre-identify exactly which data sets are being commonly accessed. It allows us to get this data into the cloud so that other applications can leverage it, again, without the manual operational overhead of having to, you know, copy it, make sure it's in sync, all those, all those different um, concerns. Okay. So uh, in terms of Alexio, uh, the way it works is, is actually very similar to HDFS, where you have a name node and data node. And so in this example, uh, what we've got is a kind of typical reference architecture for Alexio. Um, we've got uh, a very large number of uh, machines running Presto. We've got a lar very large number of machines running Spark. And we're running Alexio workers co-located on all of this. And so those Alexio workers are going to connect to the storage layers, and they're going to leverage some of the leftover space on that machine from a memory standpoint, an SSD standpoint, or spinning disk standpoint, you know, whatever's available, uh, to cache some of this data locally and avoid having to make round trips uh, when these applications want data. And so the way it works is that either of these applications will talk to an Alexio client to make the request, and they might say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm looking for this piece of data. Alexio client will go to the Alexio master and see if that data exists within any of the workers that make up the local cluster. And if it does, great. It'll service it, um, and it'll service it from the closest worker. If it doesn't, it will designate a worker that should be responsible for that chunk of data, and that worker will reach out to where that data lives. It might be HDFS. It might be the object store. Fetch that data and cache it locally. And so very, very simple architecture, uh, very elastic. Um, you know, it's very easy to add capacity in this case. And if uh, a worker goes missing, um, the Alexio master is able to say, hey, I no longer have access to that piece of data. We're going to have to fetch it from HDFS and, and store it on a new worker, right? So very, very simple design, uh, very efficient to run in cloud architectures. Um, in terms of interacting with Alexio, it's also very, very simple. Um, you know, depending on the kind of application that you are working with, um, you're going to access it in exactly the way that you might access, you know, HDFS or S3 today uh, with a URI. Um, in something like Presto, uh, there are a few very easy ways to work with Alexio. Uh, we've made it seamless, much, much, much more seamless in the last year, such that, uh, you know, you can be leveraging Alexio 
uh, with your normal queries and not even know it, right? It's, uh, it's, it's gotten to that point, right? So a lot of different ways to interact uh, with Alexio, but these are just, you know, some of the, some visuals for what it actually looks like uh, when you're actually working with these applications. Okay, so we spent some time, you know, talking about, um, you know, the challenges of um, accelerated queries against cloud data lakes. Uh, we spent some time talking about hybrid cloud environments, and we've spent some time talking about Alexio. Um, let's open it up now for some questions. You know, um, anything that you're curious about, anything that you might want to dig into. Um, let's uh, let's leave it open uh, now for that. So, Shannon, do we have um, uh, anything interesting? We do. And just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday with links to the slides and links to the recording of this presentation. So diving in here, Alex, um, I assume the first user gets pretty bad performance. Do you have staged queries to uh, you run to warm up the cache? Yeah, so, so that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily characterize that it as pretty bad performance, and I, I guess pretty bad depends on, on how you're defining things. But, you know, the, the first user that is making a request for that kind of data is going to see the exact same kind of performance that they would see if they didn't have Alexio in the environment, right? And so if you're doing um, a query that looks at three terabytes of data over a one gig link, uh, yeah, I, I would definitely define that as terrible. Um, so, so you're not wrong there. But uh, to answer your question, yeah, you know, Alexio is, is used in a couple different ways. So some users will pre-stage the queries. They'll know that, hey, the, you know, this user is going to uh, do this kind of operation against this partition of the table. So we're going to do a, a select star, you know, with a predicate set so that it's going to hit, you know, the, the most common things that user is going to request. Um, and that's one way to do it from an application standpoint. And so. Uh, the application or the user can can stage that before beforehand, but what you can also do uh, in Alexio is you can actually load that preemptively, and so you can actually run a command that says, "Hey, you know, I want to load all this data preemptively along this path." And so, in one way, you're doing it kind of more application centric and having um, that application translate what data is requested to Alexio. In the other way, you're telling Alexio directly, "Hey, data on this path is, is hot." and I want you to load it. Uh, and so you can do that in either case, uh, but the end result is that, you know, that first user that's running that query is gonna have a much better experience because that data is already cached in a local worker in the Luxio cluster. And what tools are Alexio built on? Um, so, Alexio is not so much, I mean, Alexio is built on, on some tools. There are, you know, uh, different components that make up the framework itself. Uh, we leverage things like gRPC and Netty. Uh, you know, we're not going to build our own uh, communication protocols for, for things like Java. But, um, you know, to, to answer your question more broadly, you know, Alexio is an open source technology that was built from the ground up. And, you know, it was built as part of a PhD project uh, from the Berkeley AMP Lab. And originally, it was built to be the off-heap persistence layer for Apache Spark. And so and it started off as a project probably five years ago, and it's grown dramatically since then in terms of, you know, the number of people contributing to it on GitHub and also from what the product can do from just a functionality perspective. So now, you know, it's not uh, dedicated only to Apache Spark, but it ties in with all these other technologies. Um, but to answer your question, you know, Alexio is an open source technology. It's built on top of Java, um, and uh, and yeah, hopefully that helps. Indeed, and, and, uh, Alex, does the cache get cleared on a daily or monthly basis and repopulated starting with a new query day or month? Yeah, so that, that's also a great question. So um, it, it's configurable. So you can set uh, time to live for data in the cache. Uh, you can do that along specific paths. So you might say, hey, data, data is, that's accessed over here is kind of archival data. I want you to remove from the cache after 24 hours. Or, you know, hey, data in the cache um, here is kind of more medium term, remove it after 30 days. Um, you also have the option of pinning that data so that it's always in a given tier in Alexio. 
Um, so you have a lot of different configuration options. And uh, I would say, you know, kind of run the system for a little bit, see what the usage patterns are like, see what data is hot. Um, but, you know, there's a, a number of different ways that you can tune this, um, and it comes from uh, eviction algorithms, pinning strategies, time to live strategies, uh, but there's uh, a number of different ways to configure it. And what are the maximums for Alexio cluster? Um, so the maximums, I mean, you can look at maximums in a very large number of ways, right? Um, data density, cluster size, throughput. Um, we'll try to give you the maximums for each of those. Um, we have some uh, clusters that are running in uh, large Chinese companies uh, that are running, uh, I think, at somewhere around 1,600 nodes in a cluster. Uh, and so that's, that's obviously a, a very large uh, Spark cluster um, that's running uh, that has Alexio co-located uh, with it. And from a node count, you know, that's, that's the largest that I know of off the top of my head. From a data density standpoint, um, I forget the exact numbers, but we have some clusters that are provisioned with capacity for multiple single-digit petabytes. Um, and so, you know, those clusters actually have multiple tiers. So they have a memory tier and a disk tier, and it kind of depends on um, what, you're, what you're looking to do with it. Um, but uh, essentially, you're building up a cluster of many machines, um, and you're leveraging the resource on those machines. So if you've got, you know, uh, multiple terabytes of disk on each machine and a few hundred gigabytes of RAM, uh, you have the, the capacity for a lot of uh, potential space. Uh, and lastly, I think from a throughput standpoint, in terms of maximums, you know, um, a lot of it's concurrency driven. And so the, the number of um, threads that are requesting data is really going to drive the throughput. Uh, but we have a few users that are what I would call interface saturated. Uh, and so really what that means is that they're able to uh, drive enough traffic from a client perspective that occasionally they will hit interface saturation on the machines that Alexio is running on. Uh, and so what they've done in those cases is bond multiple interfaces together to give them additional network capacity. Um, you know, obviously they're leveraging uh, the memory tier uh, for Alexio uh, or leveraging uh, an NVMe or an Intel Octane um, persistent memory tier uh, to get that kind of throughput on the machine that they're, you know, um, you know saturating the network interface. But, uh, you know, along those three dimensions, that, that should give you a sense of what the maximums Alexio is capable of or has been seen in, in production environments. And Alex, uh, what third-party databases and other products are supported by Alexio? Uh, could you repeat that one more time? Sure. Uh, so sure. what third-party uh, databases and other products are supported by Alexio? Yeah, so that's, uh, that's also a good question. And I think that, that's also one of the areas where um, people tend to get confused with Alexio itself. And so Alexio is not a, a database per se or a database management system. Um, it ties into, uh, it connects a lot of big data frameworks with a lot of storage layers. And the thing I understand is if you look at this bottom layer, um, everything in here is, is essentially file-based, right? And so we're looking at uh, multiple different kinds of cloud object stores. We're looking at things like HDFS. We're looking at things like NetApps um, and uh, a couple other things. But uh, again, uh, everything is kind of uh, file oriented, and so the the database functionality that we tie into usually it's the one that's going to be leveraging um, Spark SQL or something like Presto or Hive, and they're going to be leveraging it against uh, ORC files or Parquet files uh, or those types of things, right? Not against the traditional uh, database system like an Oracle or MySQL, and so that's one really important thing to understand with Alexio. It's it's focused on files, um, and in the big data world, uh, that actually maps to uh, a file storage format for data, uh, but it's not, not necessarily focused on, on databases. And how is unstructured data 
quality, or data quality streaming handled, including black data? Uh, I'm going to need a, a little bit more context if, uh, if the user that asked that question could add just a little bit more information, uh, I could probably help respond. Sure. And maybe we can so, move on to the, the next one until then. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so while he's doing that, let me jump to the next question. So is how is security handled between data storage layers and file systems? So also a good question. Um, again, everything with the Lux show is, is fairly flexible. So uh, the, the basic answer to your question is it can either define its own policies or it can tie into whatever it is that you're using to define your, your authorization and authentication policies. And so commonly uh, we get a lot of requests for things like uh, Apache Ranger, um, LDAP, uh, Kerberos, uh, and so we tie in with all those mechanisms for identifying, hey, this user is the user they say they, they are, and this user is allowed to do this kind of operation. Um, if, you, if you don't have one of those systems to tie into, you can actually uh, just use Alexio as is. And so Alexio goes, you know, without any of those things, Alexio goes on a basic uh, POSIX framework for security from a file system and authorization standpoint. And so it will, it can leverage, you know, the OS users and groups and um, define permissions, you know, um, with the Unix octal permission set. Uh, so the, the read, write, execute uh, for user, group, and world. And so um, it's able to tie into either mechanism for, you know, when you're just testing out Alexio, it makes a lot of sense just to, um, just to use the default. But then as you move into production, it may make a lot more sense to tie it into Ranger or tie it into um, Active Directory or LDAP. Perfect. Uh, um, and can you do machine learning and data signal processing on Alexio? Uh, what I mean is if it can select what type of data to store and process? So I'm not 100% uh, sure what data signal processing is, but I mean, we do have a very large number of users that are doing uh, machine learning in a variety of different ways. And so they're using technologies like uh, Apache Spark, they're using things like TensorFlow, uh, they're using things like SageMaker, they're using things uh, like Presto, which is kind of surprising to me because I, I don't think of it as a machine learning technology. Um, but uh, to answer the question, you know, they're using all of these different frameworks to to, to do machine learning, to train models, uh, to do those sorts of things. And uh, all of these frameworks are just accessing data along a given path. And so, um, you know, the developer or whoever is uh, managing that application is simply telling it, you know, hey, this is where the training data set's located, or, you know, here's where I want you to output this data set. And that data set, ha that, that location happens to be an Alexio path. And so uh, Alexio is not doing anything specific to um, decide what data to service. It's more uh, the person that is running those frameworks is, is saying, hey, this is my training data set, uh, this is my uh, verification data set, that, those sorts of things. Uh, hopefully that helps answer the question. Great, thanks, Alex. And going back to the previous question you asked for more information on, the original question was mm -hmm. how is unstructured data quality streaming handled, including black data? And to expand on that, uh, during the unstructured data insertion into a data lake, how is the real-time streaming of data handled, thereby also handling the unused black or log data considering dealing with telecom network data? Oh, uh, okay, gotcha, gotcha. So, um, you know, it's it's an interesting question. You know, how do I how do I get data into the warehouse or into the lake? If it's coming from logs, if it's coming from you know JSON files, if it's coming from CSV, and so, you know, Alexio itself is you know not really going to do anything super special for that. You're still typically going to need a, a framework to help transform that data that's coming in, right? And so you might have something like an, uh, Apache Spark. Uh, that's doing ETL against that data that's coming in, that's doing a little bit of cleansing on it before it goes into the lake, right? Uh, you might be using Spark or you might be using Kafka. Uh, in those cases, uh, what can be helpful is that Alexio can act as kind of a, a temporary memory buffer for writes. 
And so a lot of times what happens is that uh, data, as it's, as it's getting uh, cleansed, you know, if you will, as it, as it comes in from uh, a, an unstructured to more and more structured uh, before it gets into the lake, you know, there, there are going to be multiple operations against that data. And so Alexio could act as a temporary memory buffer where you're able to do those writes uh, and handle a very large volume of data and be able to process it and use it as a temporary storage location so that it can pass from phase to phase uh, of that cleansing process. And so, you know, we've seen users where, um, you know, it, the, the cleansing process starts as something like, you know, multiple 300 terabytes of, um, you know, just raw data. Um, and an HPC cluster will process that first, uh, and then it will move to multiple different Spark jobs. Um, and then, you know, somewhere along the end of that, you know, um, along, along the end of the, you know, multiple operations, that data is uh, fit, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's ready for, you know, a TensorFlow machine learning workload, right? But, um, you know, uh, Alexia is not specifically tied to that, but uh, it can be used, uh, you know, to help with those kinds of things. I love it, and I love all these great questions coming in. Uh, just uh, back to machine learning, Alex. You know, how many machine learning techniques uh -huh. um, can Alexio take? Uh, the question was the how many machine learning techniques? Correct. Yeah. Again, it's um, it's really really simple. Um, I mean, the the number of machine learning techniques is going to be just limited by the the framework that you're using, and so. Um, you know, the, the things that I see commonly for machine learning, PyTorch, TensorFlow, SparkML, um, and probably a couple other things that I'm blanking on. But um, all of the techniques uh, are, are going to be available, you know, are going to be whatever is available within those frameworks. Uh, the thing about machine learning that's, that's interesting is a lot of it's, you know, based on training, right? And so the better data that you have, the more of that data that you have, uh, the better and more accurate and faster a model you come out with, right? And so um, what we've seen is that a lot of times these models, um, you know, it's not, it's not like you run, you run the thing once. Uh, a lot of times what we see in the enterprise environments is that these things go through a thousand iterations of the training run uh, before you actually get to an efficient model. And at each point, at each iteration, you're tweaking various parameters and you're looking for, you know, what is gonna, um, what is gonna align best with the data that I have. And so as part of that, right, you are leveraging Alexio to keep that data in memory and close to the GPU or close to whatever it is that you're doing the training with such that it's able to trade much more efficiently. And so again, to answer the question, you're, 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 you're going to have available whatever techniques are available for the given framework that you're using, but the number of models that you're able to generate is going to be substantially higher uh, because you're going to be getting better utilization out of that training framework. Uh, we have one customer um, that after they start using uh, Alexio, um, they have this process that they go through of, you know, uh, cleansing, filtering, uh, and then training data training against data, and they're able to, with Alexio, generate four times as many models per year uh, as they could without it, right? And that just kind of speaks to, you know, hey, we're, we're doing all these advanced things, but we also need a platform where, you know, we're doing something that's very iterative and very read heavy, um, and having something like Alexio uh, just makes that process a lot more efficient. So hopefully that helps. What's the minimum hardware requirements for Alexio worker node? So I think we have the minimum uh, up on our website. Um, and it, if I had to guess, it would probably be something like four vCPU, eight gigabyte of RAM, uh, and a network connection. Um, you know, we have Alexio run across a very wide span of um, hardware. And so in, in our own testing environments, we run it in containers with, um, you know, a slightly lower spec than that uh, because we're, we're doing um, large cluster simulation uh, and multi-node testing. We have uh, some customers that have this deployed on machines with, um, you know, I think, just under 100 uh, CPU cores and probably close to a terabyte of RAM and multiple petabytes of NVMe. So it kind of, it kind of goes all over the place in terms of the machine spec. Um, the question I would really ask is, you know, what, what framework are you using? 
and what resources is it bound on. And so if you're using Spark, um, <clears throat> it might want for memory and CPU, and you might say, you know, hey, uh, I've got a little bit of memory left over on this machine. I can, I can allocate that Alexio, um, and, or I've got some SSD lying around. Uh, Alexio, the workers themselves, are not going to be ter terribly uh, compute heavy, um, which is great because, you know, all these big data frameworks are. And so really what Alexio is going to want from a minimum requirement is whatever you have available from the machine uh, that's left over. And in some cases, you know, for a given workload and for a given uh, requirement, it may make sense to say, well, hey, we're going to have a, we're going to bump up the physical capacity of this machine because we have defined, you know, multiple terabytes of hot data and we have this many nodes and we want to use Alexio to store it. And so we're, we're going to do the math for, for what makes sense. But um, you know, the minimum is, is pretty small. The maximum is, is fairly large. Uh, but uh, you should look at what is in your environment and what's left over and uh, start there uh, and, and see if it makes sense to increase it more. I love it. Great answer. So uh, do you distinguish between unstructured and non-structured data? Well, Alexio itself doesn't, right? Uh, again, it is going to serve as a bridging layer to um, provide more seamless access to data. Um, to cache that data locally and to possibly help you migrate and start populating that data lake in the cloud. And so Alexio is, 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 to be quite honest with you, very agnostic about data. And so um, the application, you know, it might be Spark or it might be Presto, it's going to request a, a given piece of data, it's going to request a file. And what it does with that file, you know, Alexio doesn't really know much about that. But Alexio is bridging the connection to where that file is located, where that data is stored. And it is optimizing that by, you know, uh, reducing the overhead for, you know, where it's located, how to connect to it, those sorts of things, and making the access to that file more efficient by caching it locally for that, that, that piece of data that's, uh, for that application that's requesting it. So, uh, no, to be honest with you, we, <laughs> we don't differentiate between unstructured and semi-structured uh, data. It's, it's more about um, if your application is able to, to work with that. All right. Well, I think we have time to slip in one more question here, Alex. So the tough question of the day, you've given us so many good reasons and, and uh, for, to use Alexio and, and what a great product it uh -huh. is. Um, what problems have you noticed using it and what are the contraindications for usage? Where is it not uh, appropriate? Well, the, the last, where is it not appropriate? Okay. So let's see here. So the question is where, where is it not appropriate? And what was the first part of that question? What challenges yeah, what, have I noticed with uh, notice. uh -huh. Okay, gotcha. Um, let's see here. That is a tough question. <laughs> so um, let's let's start with the easier part of that question and give me a, a second to think about that. Where is it not appropriate? So uh, you know, I think we touched on this a little bit earlier, but um, you know. A lot of users will think of it as a, uh, a way to accelerate queries against remote data lakes. And um, not many people make a, I mean, I should say not many people, but some people make the distinction between a SQL-based data lake, you know, something like a, a Snowflake or an Aurora or an Oracle cluster, and things like a, um, you know, a Hadoop data lake. And those are obviously very, very different things. Uh, and you have some technologies like Presto that, you know, don't really care. They'll, they'll, they can ask questions of either. Um, but Alexia is definitely more focused, again, on the file aspect of this. Right? And so where I'd say it's, uh, it's not really appropriate is, you know, if, uh, uh, if you're leveraging any kind of ODBC or JDBC connectivity to, to get to the data itself, um, Alexio may not be a fit for you, right? It's going to be focused on connecting your application to an HDFS data lake, uh, a data lake that lives on an object store, and a, a data lake that maybe lives off of NFS. Right, and so um, I say that's that's the first thing. Um, remember that, and uh, you know, solve, save yourself some some time trying to integrate it with an Oracle. Uh, for the next question, um, let's see here. Uh, what challenges have we seen with it? I think you know anything in the big data world, um, it can be it can be challenging just because there are so many moving parts. Right, so sometimes you add uh, a component into this, and um, 
you know, you don't quite know what to look at to troubleshoot what's going on. And so what I'll say is that, uh, you know, look at the default settings in Alexio um, and understand what it is that you're configuring. Um, the, default, um, the default options for Alexio are things like uh, writing only to memory as opposed to writing to um, the, the storage layer. Uh, the default options allow you to have multiple copies of the data, which is going to take up additional room in memory. Uh, the default options, you know, um, you, you, there's no default option for where you're storing data, but obviously understand that, you know, if uh, you give Alexio access to uh, a place to store data, and that data is, you know, a, uh, uh, a spinning disk EBS volume, uh, that is not going to be quite as performant as giving it memory. So it's, I would say, you know, where it causes problems is, uh, is maybe with some of the default options, adding it into a big data environment and kind of not knowing what, what area to look at, and then uh, having the correct expectations for what it's going to do. Um, and so I, I don't think these challenges are, you know, specific to something like Alexio. You add anything into an environment where, you know, you have a few dozen machines, uh, it adds a layer of complexity to it. And so uh, to, to soften that, you have to, to really understand the technology uh, or at least have a, a basic understanding of it and have the correct expectations for, for what it's doing. And so I'd say the problems that we have are, are maybe where some of those things are not aligned. <laughs> And um, that's probably the, the best I can do with that additional, with that additional uh, detail. Alex, I love it. This has been so good and what a great presentation and thanks uh, so much for this. Uh, and thanks to all of our attendees for being uh, so engaged in everything we do. Love all the great questions. Just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday with links to the slides and links to the recording of this session. Uh, again, thank you so much for attending and Alex, thank you so much for this great presentation. Hope everybody stays safe out there. Thanks for the time, everyone. Thanks, Rob.